Welcome to the Two Mats and a Jeff podcast. We're just some middle-aged guys talking sports. And uh, you might be listening to us on your favorite podcast uh, provider like Spotify or Anchor. Or you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook. And we ask you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and like our YouTube channel as well. So today's episode is all about our Philadelphia 76ers. So we're going to wrap up the season here. They just recently got bounced or swept rather from the playoffs. And uh, so we're going to kind of review the season, review some stuff with the team and what we think went right, what went wrong, what we might do differently, like we were in charge of anything because we're not. But so, uh, you know, one of the first things I think we need to start with, guys, is Brett Brown. He just got fired, uh, deservingly so in my opinion. So what do we think about Brett Brown, the job he did, and and what we would have done differently? Well, um, I was going to say, I think, you know, I think he's a good coach. But, you know, there's a lot of butts in there. Um, you know, he went through all the bad times. Right. Um, and I think, you know, we saw some, some good things from him there. Um, but then, you know, as he started getting, you know, the good players, you know, like I said, we're going to talk about a lot about things. But um, just in general, like I think, you know, he's probably going to get hired somewhere else, I think. You think um, he'll get hired as a head coach somewhere? I think he will. Um, Somebody will take yes. a chance. On see, I don't, I, I don't see him right because away I, getting a head coach. I think it's job. more I mean, the per, this, I think it's more the personalities on the team that he because I think one of the one of the things I wrote down with him is you know that he coddled his players and especially and I think because of the bond he had with Ben Simmons, um, you know the Australian connection thing, right. um, that I mean, that that hurt you know. Ben Simmons. That hurt his relationship with Embiid, right? Well, in or? that that you know um, he wasn't tough on, you know he. I think he kind of treated him with like a son rather than like kid gloves, right? Maybe. I mean, I, I think that you know up until recently I was not on the Friar Brett Brown train. I was I was not right. up until very recently. But I he, I think he's made some missteps in how he used the personnel that he had provided to him. Yeah. Um, and well, you know, you can argue about what impact he had on who he got, who he got, and who he didn't get. There's yeah. certainly, you know, something we'll he, talk about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he had the, he had the personnel to do better than he did. And I look at certain aspects of what he did or didn't do, and I question it. You know, like, okay, why is Joel Embiid out at the three point line as much as he is? The offense that was designed had him out there, in my opinion. I don't think Joel just decided to go out there. I think that was what was drawn up. Well, I take issue with that. Some of the time, and I like that he can spread the floor, but that drawing that up, Brett, and I'm not sure that that's the best use of, of his talent and the best use of things, and you could see that they weren't getting things out of that, and that was challenging for them. And that comes right down to his decision to do that offense. I do say part of that, I think, is... You know the lack of which I'm sure we'll get into this with Embiid is that his lack of conditioning Embiid that he may not have wanted to go down there block to block every time, you know. And part of the you know it's him trailing he can hit that three once in a while. But yeah, I do agree. I think <coughs> there was a bunch of it that was already pre pre planned by the coach. But to me, <coughs> this, I wrote down that their half court offensive sets just seemed very limited and basic to me. Based on I'm not talking they had to be like Golden State or anything, but based on watching other teams compete against the Sixers, when the Sixers are on offense, their offense seems limited or basic compared to it's just this one-on-one, pick-and-roll, players who shouldn't, a like, beat should be on the block or whatever, just, it just didn't seem like it was in sync. I mean, in today's NBA, there's so many analytics being used and so much film study that teams know your tendencies, and I don't think that Brett Brown was innovative as a coach offensively and to think about you know he he had a lot of time from march to when they started back up to really i mean that's that's his job is well to, he did come up with putting ben at right. the four and well, shake at the one but that might not have been the best decision i'm gonna tell you right now yeah. i think that decision was a huge mistake right and i thought it was a mistake from the get-go so he made that decision now he owns that oh yeah he owns that completely and to me you don't take the ball out of ben simmons hands a uh, uh, a talent like that, a guy that could be a transcendent talent, and a guy that's been successful doing what he's doing, and take a guy like Shate Milton, who I, I'm not going to say he's a bad player, but this 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 plan and this plan this late in the season, I don't I, don't, I didn't think it, it didn't work. Clearly, didn't work. Right. But I didn't think it was going to work, and I didn't like the idea of moving Ben to the four. I don't think you're optimizing your talent. I think it was as much as how do we 
not have Horford in the lineup to start with uh, Embiid as it right. was moving Ben to the four. Could, yeah, what pieces can we move? Right. Okay, we'll move Ben to the fours because that will get it. He can rebound. He can whatever. But do you think that if he designed a better offense to include Horford and Embiid at the same time, that that could have worked out better? That's the question. I don't know. That's a good question. But I don't know whether or not it's possible to have – Horford, they're, they're they're too much of the same position. Yes, exactly. I mean, especially when you think now of the NBA, Horford's not four, a stretch right? Four. Exactly. He's not. He does. He's not. He, he can hit the three once in a while, three, but he's, he's not a stretch. Yeah, his main thing is the rebounding and playing underneath. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess I look though, and you know, this is old school, so maybe this doesn't work anymore. Although yeah. I would think that it does. You look at I look at take the Boston Celtics for example. Right. Well, Kevin McHale. Was not a stretch, you know. Four. He's a four that played the bot, the, the played down low, and so did Cherish. So, did, so, you know, I, I guess I think again going back to my earlier point about Brett Brown is, could he have designed an offense that would better? Because I didn't like the offense they were doing anyway. Right. Could he have designed it better that would have included Horford? Maybe he could have, maybe he couldn't have. But a solution, with, if the solution was the Shake Milton experiment, well, that, that experiment that failed miserably. Right. Well, and you also think about where did Brett Brown come from? San Antonio, Antonio, who had two big men. Yes, right. <laughs> now, granted, you can't compare those two big men right. to, uh, to our two big men. But, but I mean, think he, did, did Al Horford really fall off that much from where he was? In, when he was on the Celtics, he made us look bad in the playoffs. Think, he was a guy we, I was scared to see out but, there. But, but think about it. He in that role, he was playing the five. The five yeah, right? the that's four. true. They didn't need him as the four. I th- yeah, it comes, I was going to say, I think part of this is coming down to another decision. Right. I'll talk about that. Well, I'll I think the about. last thing I would say about Brett Brown, for me, at least one of the last things that I find to be, well, two things I find to be extremely frustrating. One is, it seemed like either nobody listened to him in a timeout, or they didn't know what they were doing. Because they would come out of a timeout and run nothing. And you'd watch other teams come out of a timeout and run a designed play, and I can't, I can't count the number of times they would get out of a timeout and do nothing, and sometimes not even turnover, get a shot off. Get a turnover, right. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I wrote down was: it seemed to me that he really didn't have true authority. The players liked him, kind of lack respect. Yeah. But they, they lacked respect. They didn't think of him as a basketball savant authority. or authority. Um, you know, he was a, their buddy, and but that's not what he's there for, right. or whatever. You know, I mean, I think he's a great guy. I wrote down he's a great guy. The players liked him and everything, but you know, I just didn't think that Brett Brown. Brett Brown to me, maybe he'll get a, a chance. I'm not sure how well he'll do. Maybe right. he will do well. Brett Brown to me seems like the perfect assistant coach, like like your your number one assistant on the bench, which probably he was right. a pop in San Antonio right. and excelled at that or whatever. And part of the challenge he had, the truth is, you know, we're a slave to our habits. And he inherited a team where the habit was losing. Yeah. And so as much as he might be good, great, I don't know what, that's hard to come off that with the same team to take. I know it's not the same team because it wasn't the same players. Right. But the guy who lost for five years straight yeah. and now shift gears into winning mode and getting to winning time. So that hurt him that wasn't his fault. But something I do think was his fault and, and is transitioning into players a little bit is I don't think he used the players he had effectively. Well, I was just going to say substitution. And, yeah, substitution. There was no substitution pattern. I mean, you know, you see it here in the playoffs, and I'll, I'll let you guys talk, but the point that I would always make, and you guys have heard me say this before, is why is Neto getting in the game when he's in the playoffs? He's seeing major time in playoff games where in the play-in games, he saw no time but garbage time. Right. There was no rhyme or reason to his substitution pattern. It was almost like the play-in games were preseason, and then he got to the playoffs, and that was the start of the regular season, and they yep, needed to fi- still figure things out. Right. When that should, I mean, you didn't see other, I mean, some teams had no choice because guys were on, on, you know, uh, out of the bubble for COVID reasons right. or whatever. So they had to make adjustments in right. the play-in games or whatever. But they didn't have you know, that. at that point in the season, they whether you had off since March or not, you should not be figuring things out in playing well, games or at the beginning of the playoffs. Plus, yeah, like, you know, Alec Burks, for example, was having a great, you know, yeah. the game before had a great game. Yeah. Who's the first off the bench or was one of the first was Neto, not, not Burks. Burks. Burks didn't come in. And then Cork Moss, and then Burks didn't come in for a long I don't think he saw time in the first quarter at all in that game. And he was the the best player the previous game basically on their team. It's well, and the one game, I forget what it was, I even showed a stat, like uh, uh, Tatum was like 
two for whatever against Thibault right. when Thibault was guarding him, and then he didn't even play it hardly the, early in the yeah. next game, and Tatum went off. Right. It, it seemed to me that I could never figure out what the rhyme or reason was to his substitution patterns, and, and it right. would change from game to game. And right. maybe he thought he was smarter than the game or something, or maybe he was looking at some analytics or something. I don't know. But to me, they made no sense whatsoever. Well, one thing I wrote down that to me it seemed like he was always outwitted or he didn't make the right adjustments, whether it was player personnel in the game or not. Like, I, I just thought he was completely outcoached this year in the playoffs by Brad Stevens, and last year he was completely outcoached by Nick Nurse. Now, you're granted, this Nick Nurse just won right. Coach of the Year and this year with Toronto he, without Kawhi, and Brad Stevens is an awesome coach. Right. Right. So it's not like, you know, he's getting out coached by, you know, Joe Schmo. Or well, whatever. he got out coached by Brad Stevens before. Well, too. yeah, the previous, <laughs> yeah, the previous year. The previous in year the playoffs. Before the Clearly right. out coached. Right. So, you know, like, I just, you know, to me, things I saw were – Teams would, especially this year, without the outside shooting, teams would zone the Sixers. And he did not – he just didn't make any adjustments. Right. Away. You know, they, they just played the same way right. against the zone versus whether or not whatever. And, like, another one I mentioned – or one I have written down that I wanted to mention is when I went to see them play the Mavericks uh, early December or sometime in December uh, this year at home, Tim Hardaway Jr. went off. Like, just – like, could not – the basket was huge, could miss. It's not like he didn't make any adjustment to keep him from to, to keep the same thing against uh, the TJ Warren in yeah. that game in a, in a playing yeah. game or yeah. whatever against the, the Pacers. Yes. He did not make any adjustments. Right, and we all said at halftime at that game against the Pacers. Yeah. I know what I would be saying to the team if I was the coach: any, make anybody else beat us, but that guy. Right, and that is there are no adjustments no. there. So that one last ahead. thing, and this will help transition. I think you're going to transition. I think this will help transition. The only thing I would say in Brett Brown's defense, <laughs> was his hands were tied somewhat for a few reasons. One, Embiid never truly in the post, never purely on the block. Two, Simmons' lack of a J, which we're going to get into all this stuff. And three, a lack of three-point shooters, especially this season. So his hands were somewhat tied offensively because of these things or whatever, which we'll get into. Right. So, but I would last word on yeah, that yeah. is his hands were tied, but a good coach oh, will no. figure out how to utilize the weapons that he does have more effectively. And yes. I think he didn't use those weapons as effectively as he could. Yeah. But you're right about some of the players. So yeah. I think you want to, we got to start the conversation about players with Ben and Joel. Yeah. And so, the, the and, and then we can talk about the rest of the guys. But, you know, what do we think about Ben and Joel? You know, if we're giving them a grade, if we're thinking about their seasons, you know, wh where do you want to start? Okay. Well, I was going to say, I'll, I'll start with Ben. Um, I think Ben is is going to be, a, you know, he's a, he's a great player. Um, and for whatever reason, he doesn't shoot. And even, and again, maybe that comes, again, I, I think that's the, whatever he had with Brett Brown. Okay. You know, Brett Brown supposedly told him he wants him to shoot whatever amount of threes in a game and he just and he didn't do it right. um i don't know if it's because ben simmons like all every other every, every other part of his game is so much better and so he doesn't want, want to look bad shooting or what it is it's just so strange because you guys know like when i like to play i like shooting right. you know most kids most, they want to shoot the ball players period like right. to shoot jumps um yeah. you know but i mean just what he does with the ball like i was actually listening you know not you know earlier today and they were talking about him and how somebody was saying how they don't think you know that they should get rid of him like I don't think they should get rid of him um maybe another coach will change some of that but I do think you know he should be the primary ball handler I mean with the ball in his hands on fast breaks you know the other thing that is so frustrating is how he can get to the basket any time and sometimes he just doesn't you know um but I mean, I think he's, you know. Yeah, if I'm breaking down, you know, Bed Simmons, you know, stuff, I, I'll get, I would give you some pushback on the jump shot that I don't care as much about his jump shooting. I would like him to shoot the ball, don't get me wrong. But I think there's so much more to his game that people don't appreciate how good he really is. But I think, you know, a great defensive player. That's where they missed him in the playoffs, maybe more than anywhere yep. else, was as his, his great defense. I want the ball in his hand. I want him playing point guard. Um, he can get to the hoop anytime he wants to. But one of the things I watched a whole um, documentary about Ben Simmons recently, and some of the things that really came to light, I think, through that, that we probably already knew, is that, you know, in order for the, an NBA player, I think, to get through the playoffs and, and be a champion, takes a lot of grit. 
You know, you have to have persevered through that. You lose and you battle back the next year. And you look at all the great players, the Magic, I mean, the the um, Michael Jordans of the world and those guys. They had to battle and earn it. Well, Ben Simmons, when he was in high school, barely ever lost a game. Then he goes to college for one year just strictly to play basketball to LSU. He doesn't step up in big games there. There were some clips in there where he passed the ball off multiple times in big games. They had no pressure on him in college whatsoever because they didn't do anything. They probably yeah. knew he was going to be a high draft pick yeah. to begin with. Yeah. But he didn't do anything. Like He didn't go to a school where he knew we're competing for the title here like for Duke, an NCAA Carolina. tournament champ. Yeah, Carolina. if he would have gone to a Duke, he went to LSU. And, I, and there were reasons for that, family connections and so on. Okay, but he never had to be in a position where you got to be the man and this is what it is. And that's what he has to do now, and he doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how to say, okay, in the last two minutes, give me the ball. I'm going to take you to the promised land. He doesn't know how to do that. He needs a coach that's going to get him there or a mentor or whatever it is to get him there. And that's a mental thing, not a physical thing. Because he's got physical gifts that are amazing. Right. Well, physical gifts, I I saw at some point, I didn't didn't write it down, but it, it sticks in my head. Under 24... There's only like, I forget, a handful of players who average what he averages, which is like, like over 15 points. Close to a triple double. Eight, close, eight. Yeah, 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 something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, whatever it is. So, I mean, so obviously, eight assists, you want the ball in his hands or whatever, mm-hmm. to, uh, getting to the rim and everything. I, I wrote down in all caps on, on my notes that no jump shot kills a Sixers offense only because they can slap They do on. not have to guard it. Guys, we yeah. play, right? Mm-hmm. I don't shoot well, except for the corners. That's it. We whatever. You don't have to come out. If I'm on the wing, out way yeah, out. Not, yeah, you don't have it. to come out. And that, that I know that that harms my team. Uh, I mean, we're playing four and four. I know that harms my, my team offensively. So that's why I don't stay in the, that spot usually or whatever. But but I'm not getting paid millions yeah. of dollars. I'm not going to go spend time thinking, working on my jump shot. So to me, I, I, to me, I also wrote down like. He didn't it seemed to me like he, you know, like you said, MJ and Magic. Those guys, every year when they got beat down, they they worked their butts off in the offseason and came back and improved. They always had one Another new trick the in their bag. Right. Every season they came back. Magic Johnson's jump shot stunk when he came into the league. And it got better every year or whatever. So it got to the point where they couldn't leave him alone or whatever out in the three-point line right. when the three-point shot became more and more part of the game as his career went on. So that to me, it's just you can see teams, they'll just they'll just lay off of him or whatever. So they, they did it to right. Giannis too. Right. But Giannis, they can't do it now. It. Right. And I, so I, I agree with that. I just uh, My point is I don't need him to be chucking up a bunch of threes. I just no. need him – to be a, a threat a to shoot. I, I love shoot. the mid-range. Yes. It's a lost art. But yes. I, I, I need yes. him to be a threat to do that. And that would then open up his game. Because if you come out to guard him, he can go More around right. you. Right. And then we know what other skills he has with passing the ball off. And and plus, yeah, he's going to say, he can finish left and right. Yeah. I mean, right. You don't even know what he is. I mean, right. You know, right. So, so, Ben certainly has room for improvement. We hope he will. To me, you know, he's a guy that... You don't get rid of, you don't look to trade or anything like yeah. that, in my opinion. I know people talk about that stuff. Yeah. I'm not interested in hearing any of that trade talk for Ben Simmons. Yeah. The, the one thing I, I want to add, and you sort of mm-hmm. touched on it or whatever, his, his his personality or not being tested and everything or whatever, I'm not expecting him to lead like Michael or Magic or whatever. But his role on the team as point guard, which he should be, you're automatically – Right, you're a, a a, somewhat of a leader. You don't have to be on everybody, you know, vocal well, that that like 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 Kobe on somebody or Michael on somebody or that type of thing. But you need to lead. That's part of your job. And yeah. I don't think he does that. And you, if the ball is in your hands, you have to be willing and able to say in the last minute of the game yes. that I'm willing to do whatever it is, whether that's shoot it, drive to the basket, or be willing to pass off. Right, right now. He's not willing to do the first two. He passes off. Well, right. and he, if you look, a lot of those end of the games, he doesn't. He's not even getting the ball. Right. You know, other guys are getting the ball. Look, look at last year, Jimmy. Jimmy yeah, that's what I mean. He's yeah. he's inbound exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, we got to talk about yeah. Joel. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I mean, we got to talk about him. Yeah. So Matt, why don't you? What's your what's your your take on Joel? <laughs> well, my all caps were now, and this is going to be questioned right away. But my all caps word for Joel Embiid is lazy, and. I wrote down right away, not during game time. So I don't think he's a lazy player 
during the game for no, the most no, part. I agree with that. Yeah. I think his laziness comes when it comes to being in shape or in his conditioning Absolutely. and the off season to be ready for the season. And even if it takes conditioning during the season to be ready for the, he's a big guy, not just tall. He's a big oh, yes. guy. So like Shaq, and that's why Kobe and Shaq sort of had their problem or whatever towards the end of their time together in, in La La Land, that I just don't think Joel, it's not important enough to him right. to be in top shape. And in today's NBA, and I wrote this down, he has to be able to be fleet of foot and defend a pick and roll because other teams feast on the Sixers. They put him in the pick and roll over and over and over again. And I don't know if, like, Brett Brown strategy-wise, I, I noticed against the Celtics, literally, he would not even come out to, to hedge, not even close to hedging on the pick and roll. And I don't know if that was on purpose, like if Brett Brown told him, or Joel just said, well, it's not, I'm tired and I can't do that every possession or whatever. But to me, that's, that's a huge disadvantage. Every player on the floor needs to be able to help defend a pick and roll. And when you're a star player can't do that to me that's a that's a huge thing and so i don't know whether it's a mental laziness or whatever on that but i just don't think he's in he's in physical shape to play especially in the playoffs because you play more minutes in the playoffs than you do during the regular season right. i was gonna say and part of that too i think is just his lays out fair attitude yes, exactly you know like and that's yes. part of the laziness i think too is that you know it seems like there's times he doesn't seem like he cares, like if they win or not. I mean, right. and 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 that's, I think the other part of it in, is that his mental parts of the game, like you know, just in one of those playoff games, they were up. He has the ball in the post or, or close, and he tries to kick it. Right. And there's a turnover. Like just you know, not. I think, and maybe this is part of his. You know, if you think about Joel Embiid, he hasn't played basketball. Uh-huh. Real, real long. And I think it's part of right. why he makes some of the mistakes that he makes is because he hasn't right. played. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. He, well, he barely played in high school because he played volleyball. And then he played half a year in Kansas or whatever. Right. So, I mean, that's why it's, so I think it's what's so frustrating with him and Ben. But with him, too, is that you can see his just physical ability, like his footwork and like his, yeah. his shot is very nice. It's smooth. Uh, right. right. And he's got, you know, like for for the lack of playing, he's got great moves underneath yeah. when he wants to do it. But what what he lacks, and this goes into this, and maybe this comes off as lazy or whatever, he has a low basketball IQ in my opinion. And it shows after they lost this last game that the interview that I saw with him afterwards, he basically <laughs> said, we're a really good team. We just didn't play, you know, we, we just didn't play well or whatever. That's why we lost. No. That's not why. There's some really specific reasons why you lost. I don't know if you don't know what those are, but I think you don't. And I think that's part of the problem is low basketball IQ, not full understanding of the game. And part of it, like you said, Jeff, I think is he hasn't been playing it long enough. And the other part of that is he's not a professional yet. And what I mean by that is he's out there having a good time. Now, he's a young guy, and he, he, he likes to clown too much. And there's a time to clown. I love having a good time, and I like his personality. But when it's winning time, when it's playoff time, it's basketball serious time. It's go time. He can't with, he can't he can't do that right now. You're not joking it up with Kemba or whatever. Yes. Like, right. Come on. Yeah. So – I'm not telling you that you got to be Michael Jordan who has a vendetta against anybody who has ever beat him in anything in his entire life. Right. But what I am saying is I need you to be a leader in some ways. I don't think he has, right. you know, I, I don't know he's going to be the leader, but I no. per se, but low basketball IQ, you got to understand the situation and things. You got to understand what you're doing in the playoffs to be able to win in a long playoff series that is weeks long. In one single game, you've shown that you can do it. Right. But he doesn't seem to, to show that. I think some of that low basketball IQ also leads him to doing things that are not wise, like you said, turnovers. in turnovers, in getting the ball up too high in the post and not making a move, in squaring up against guys that you should be backing down against. That's exactly what I wrote down. He does not get, and I don't know if this is a, because of Brett Brown told him not to do this, but I think it's more his preference. Is He gets the ball, instead of getting on the block, and, and using his physicalness to, to be to, to get the ball right on the block, he wants to get the ball three feet off the lane and face up. 
And granted, you know, he can pull that up and get the, the slap down on his wrist and get free throws and everything. And he has a great mid-range jump shot off the glass, whatever, Duncan-esque or whatever you want to call it. But my understanding is he worked with Elijah Wan, not this offseason. One offseason, he worked with Elijah Wan. And so his footwork, having played soccer, I think some too or whatever, he has great footwork and he has the physicalness. He's now, he's age. not as big as Shaq was at the when Shaq was dominant with the Lakers in the early 2000s, but he's big enough to be forceful and be dominant. And that just drives me nuts. I, I, I wrote down that if he did, if he utilized both his footwork like Elijah Wan and his physicalness like Shaq in the low post on the block, he would almost be unstoppable. Oh, yeah. And I like the other parts of his game. I just don't like him there as much. I like, periodically. Yes, periodically. I like that he ca is willing to and able to shoot a three-pointer. Yes. I just don't want him doing it so much. Right. I like that he can hit the mid-range jumper. You know, he shoots like my man Ewing was had a good... Yeah. But when you're playing against some of these teams that have guys that are considerably smaller than you, right. that's not what I want you to do. Get down to the, to the post right. and use the moves there. And one thing that I think, I'm not sure if he's incapable or doesn't under... He can't get up and down a bunch on rebounds. When he gets a rebound, he usually gets tripped up. He ends up on the floor or fouled or whatever. Right. He can grab a rebound, but he he doesn't have a good move going back to the hoop. And he, it's something he needs to work on. His the second offseason. and third jump. Yes. He can't seem to get that. And he's right. physically capable of that. Right. But he doesn't possess those skills. Right. And that might be the how uh, he's in shape. Right? I was going to yeah. say, another part of the other thing, you know, yeah. yours is uh, and defensively, he's very good too. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, kind of putting those two guys together, it's just so frustrating because, you know, and that's, here's the other problem is that they're both all-stars yeah. who, if you, if we just told them all these flaws in our game and yet they're <laughs> yeah. an all-star. Right. And I think that's the other problem is that they know, you know, well, why should I do all this? I'm already an all-star. Like there's that, well, that's where I think a lot of it's a mentality. But right. If, the, the if they want to win a championship. Right. That's, I think, what they have to do. That's and then they have, the to surround, they have to be surrounded by other players. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about that. You know, we have these two guys who, to me, in my opinion, you don't trade those two guys. You continue to build around them. And there's conversation out there by some people, and maybe you guys feel I was, differently. I was just going to say, says, what do you say about that? Like, I don't well, know. Well, talk about so, their players. Yeah, to oh. me, I think you build, build around those two guys. I'm not willing to give up on them yet because we have an opportunity for a new coach, and I'm interested to see how a new coach can get these two guys – to, to work together and to play with some other guys. So you look at the rest of the lineup, you know, uh, I like Richardson, although he doesn't do anything to impress me, and he's totally tradable, in my opinion, if you can get the right pieces for him. Um, you know, I like Tobias Harris, but you're way overpaid for Tobias Harris, and he has not done anything close to what I would expect for the price tag you had on that guy. I'm, I'm disappointed in what we got from him based on what was expected and what we right. paid. He's tradable, too. Everybody else is tradable to me. And the other guy I want to see right now with just the current pieces in the starting lineup is Alec Burks. I want him as your three right now. Given their current pieces that they have, that's what I would want to see their starting lineup to be right now would be Simmons, Richardson, Burks, Harris, and Embiid as a starting five. But I'd like to see them make some moves over the offseason that some of those guys might not be around. Now, what are your th I was gonna say? What are your thoughts about keeping them or not keeping them? Well, I, I, I had some moves for next season or whatever, but uh, that's coaching. Let's see. So, I, I personally think that there's. I don't see how even a new coach gets more out of this that the group together, Embiid and Simmons together. I just don't see it unless you're bringing Phil Jackson out of whatever to get or you know someone like that. I just don't see how there any coach that I had thought about. Whatever. I don't see how they get enough out of them to compete against, you know, the likes of anybody in the East, let alone the powerful West. That's just me. Or whatever. Okay, I was gonna so, say, yeah, for me, I, so I look at last year. Well, yeah, that. Well, okay. I meant, but that's why yeah. I think a coach can work with those two because they were a quadruple, you know, bounces yeah, from making from, to the Eastern Final, right? And they had those two guys, but. And they had other players, but I'm saying yeah. this is the that, that's my point is I think with another coach and then other moves, which is going to be difficult. So that's what I was going to say. They're they're uh, that's why I think it's not. I don't it, think it's here, possible well, to stand pat. 
Well, here's because what because of their their contracts. I think. Well, I was gonna say I don't know if we want to talk contracts yet, yeah, but, no, but I mean I have to, but yeah. I was gonna say I think, you know, I, I think they just you know if they had a great if they have one great shooter, they're a different team. Like a JJ Redick guy, you know, th- that can shoot. I mean, I think you know, you know, just if you even went because I remember going into this season. We were like we were pretty high up on them. A lot of people were high up on them, and that was with, you know, um, Horford in the lineup. Right. You, I think if you get, you know, you get a shooter instead of um, Richardson, even. They now have to go out and respect that shooter. I think they were, they were you know they that's one of the big differences from last year's team. Obviously, Jimmy Butler, you know, that's another thing too. Right. But. I think the shooter. They were missing a shooter. They couldn't shoot. Right. I mean, that team that's was where that's why teams played zone on right. them all right. the right. time. But I'm saying that's why I think if another coach and you get, but I mean, I think the shooter. Well, that's why I was going to say is that in my in my construction of the starting five that I shared there. That's why I put Burks, Burks in there because the guy can shoot. But that doesn't mean like he was. I'd say you know Richardson was a nice player, but he never came to be what I thought he was right. going to be when right. they got. They him. needed a shooter, and you know. In, in my scenario, you keep Joel and, and, and Ben, and then you build around him with some pieces. You know, to speak to Jimmy Butler, which w- what would be interesting is, you know, Jimmy uh, Jimmy Butler is a great player, um, and I, I've said this: these guys, Ben and Joel, couldn't get on the Jimmy train. Jimmy wants to win, and if you look what he's done with the Heat, those guys got on the Jimmy train. Those young players said, "We're following you, Jimmy." Right. Well, Jimmy, these guys didn't want to do it. Right. Joel and B didn't want to do it. Right. And and they didn't have a coach who said, We're doing get on the Jimmy the train. Example. Yeah, who said, here's the example. Now, I think Jimmy has some, some issues because he's never been happy anywhere, but that guy right. wants to win. And if this team would have gotten the attitude that Jimmy Butler had, they would win. They would have won. So I don't know, and this is no one will ever know, if a, the right coach could have got Joel and B, because I think Ben would follow Jimmy. I think Joel Embiid was the outlier. He's too much of a clown for Jimmy because Jimmy's all business and 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 wants to win. Could they do that? I don't know. You can't bring in. There's not a Jimmy Butler out there that you're going to be able to bring to this right. team. Right. And they don't have the money. They don't have the well, money. That, right. That's the biggest thing. I mean, and I'm going to get it. Like the, uh, you know, the, the Harris contract. Or, I mean, the reason they paid Harris, Tobias Harris, what they did they is didn't. because they gave up so much for him. So they felt they had to keep right. him or whatever. Because of what they gave up for him. But you think about what they gave up. All those players are going doing well and yeah. <laughs> but so and and with with Horford, like you know, bad contract. Yeah, it's right. a bad con. I mean, I think that you know he's a valuable asset or whatever, for, as a valuable player to keep, but not in the construct of the, of the team or whatever. So I mean, I don't know. For me, I want the for me, I would trade Joel Embiid. Only because I don't see he to me, his he he's close to his ceiling already. I don't see him because of his attitude, because of and I don't know if he gets more you know, we all get more mature as we age or whatever, but I just don't see him becoming his attitude changing into the killer instinct attitude that you need. I don't see him doing what I've said about right. getting into yeah, the but you know what happens whatever. if they trade him, Matt. Like every other guy they trade. They get better when they go somewhere else. Almost every guy they traded that they you thought was Markel Fultz was washed up. They traded him, he did better. Okafor, they traded him, he's yeah, I, maybe doing better. Yeah. I, you know, Shemet, who I didn't think was going to be right, anything, yeah. I'd love to have back right now. Well, think that's well, that's I remember looking at. I don't know how we're going here, but you know, like Shamet, um, like you think about the trades they made last year. Right. If we might have made those trades. Look what we have. I mean, you have your stretch four with um, the guy from the Suns. Uh, who am I missing? Guy from the Suns. Sarich. Oh, Sarich, you know, yeah. He's on, you know, yeah. he would be your stretch yeah. four, basically. Yeah. Shamit can shoot. Yeah. I'm just saying the guys, they spent a lot of money, you know, and that's they, why they I think. They wanted to win now. Right, which that's what I mean. They were so last close year. last year. Right. And I think you're definitely right with, you know, they had to overpay for. Um, I- so if you're yeah. if you're getting rid of Joel, who are you bringing in? Well, I'm just gonna say. So I don't see. I, I I don't. To me, Embiid's their only. Well, Simmons as well, but I would not trade Simmons. Embiid's their only tradable asset because nice. no one's gonna take Harris's contract by itself. No one's gonna take Horford at his age, his contract by himself. So. I you know I'm, I think I'm he- shipping Embiid and Harris together in a deal. So someone takes Harris's contract. 
And I'm, I mean, I, I don't know who I didn't, I, I didn't have anybody so written think, down for that, but I, I had people written down from last year's what we should right. have done. Well, I was going. I don't. I actually think when you're saying, I think I actually think he's less tradable and Bead's less tradable than like a bent. Like I, I want get rid of the bent. Well, I know, but I if meant you're like, looking from the other side. You mean right? That's what I'm saying. I think it, and you know, and Bead's because of you know how big men are just. You know, but, it's not part of a lot of the NBA's teams' games anymore. But look at look at the teams that are successful in the NBA right now. So look at the Clippers. Can you name their center? Zubats, no. right? Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Look at um, the Nuggets. Well, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, he's a good player. Yeah, yeah, but but he's not a real true power no. center. He's not going to stay in the lane or whatever. Um, you know, the NBA game today is not the power five. Right. Well, that's why I meant. That's why I think he's. On, that's why I think he's. He, he's great to trade, but that's what I'm saying. I don't think he's as tradable. Asset wise, yeah. Right. Well, like I said, yeah. I don't want to trade either one of them. But if I'm going to trade one of them, Joel will be yeah, the one me, I want to trade because I think it got a much bigger upside with Ben Simmons. Uh, you know, right. I'd like to hope that his that Ben that Joel his ceiling is higher than it is, but maybe you may very well be right. I think Ben's upside is. He's got a ways to go, and I think if under he, the right tutelage, right. you get a good, the right coach and a mentor. A mentor with yes, him. with him, and I think you know you keep him in the point guard position and you mold him. You know, I'll say Magic Johnson is where he could go. Not as great as Magic, right. but that right. kind of guy with his height and his ball handling. And, you know, the guy I'd want to get, whether, however we're packaging, for me, right. at least one of the guys out there that helps with the shooting is Buddy Heald. I'd love to get that guy. But you may have to mortgage the farm to get him, and I'm not sure about I'm not sure about that. I'm well, not sure what they're – how that all – there's a lot of stuff there that I don't, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to understand. Right. Contracts. Right. Well, I was just going to say, you know, right. I wrote down, you know, quickly, you know, Tobias, 33 – Next, this is next year's yeah. contracts. Yeah. 33.5 million for Tobias – 29.5 for Dwell, 29.2 for Ben, and 27.5 for Horford. Right. So, I mean, so there, how are you, unless you're trading your, 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 one of your valuable assets, nobody's trading solo for Horford. Nobody's no, trading solo for But that's for why Harris. I was thinking. So, you, you, you can't surround these guys. You're not going to get anybody reasonable. But that's why I'm for, thinking. I think value Richardson, them. if you got rid of Richardson, you're not going to get anything for him. You're not. But. So that brings me back to my, I think, point of coaches and coaching. Yeah. Because I think your core is probably who it's going to be. You might be able to right. trade for some pieces on the periphery. Some of these guys, right. you know, you know, because uh, there's a there's some yeah. guys on the bench that you might be able to get something for that someone else might be interested in to get you some pieces to fill in. Right. I mean, I would love to package a, a Richardson and some of these other guys to get a shooter because Cork Moss right. is not going to be your shooter. No. He's not. No. He's proven that. Right. He had a couple of streaky games. Um, you know, Shake Milton is not going to be, I'm sorry, he's just not. He might be a decent piece off the bench. Right. Uh, you know, but there's pieces there, like, you know, I, I, I'd like to keep, I'd like to hang on to Thibel. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they use Mike Scott nearly well enough, and he's yeah. a guy I think has some decent skill. Yeah. Um, and Glenn Robinson, who had some injury issues, who I actually think is a good player, but they have too many of that same player. Right. Like Glenn Robinson, Josh Richardson, Alex Burks, um, they're all the same Thibel, player. Right. Thibel, they're almost all the same yes. player. They got too many of those guys. Right. And not enough. So you could get rid of a couple of those guys and pick up some other pieces, but you're not going to get any superstar. No. But if you could get that one shooter that is a guy that if you need a, a three, two shooters, but you need well, a guy if you need a three, but, that he's going to get it for you. Right now there's not a guy in there right. but here's, that's, that's going to do that. I look back again. I'll go back to last year a little bit. Like Tobias Harris, like – he played better last year, I thought, and he shot better. That's yes. why I think when you, you know, that's why I think we really, if we can get one just knockdown guy that you know, I go, you know, JJ Redick has his flaws, but at least you know he, you know, he'll knock down that three. And that's where I think then it gets puts a little pressure off of somebody like a Harris. You know, I think he felt the pressure that he has right. to make the three, right. which you know, if he, there's another guy knocking down the three. Harris is going to have a little less of that pressure. I mean, obviously, he's getting paid a lot of well, money. Well, that's what I was going to say. If money's getting paid, he needs to be well, yeah. To I mean, I, unfortunately, I think, you know, you know, we got him for that. But I think somebody else was going to get him yeah. basically He was for probably going to get paid for that. But right. he's making the kind of money that he should want the ball in his hands at the right. end of the game, too. 
I mean, you know, I th- go ahead. No, I was going to say, so, you know, those pieces. So that kind of leads into a little bit of conversation about, you know, Elton Brandt and the right. job that he has done. Right. And also, you know, what does he do? How did he do? And what does he do for bringing in a new coach and that kind of thing? I mean, uh, I'm not at the point where I think he needs to go. I know some people said that they think he should. And it sounds like he's not going to. And I, I, I want to see what else he can do here. I think he's tried. He made some... What seemed like wise deal at the, at the time, it didn't exactly pan out. I mean, I don't blame him for the Horford deal. You, I, I, everyone thought Horford was going to be more than, right. a, and you paid the guy what you had to pay the guy, I guess. But, to get him. Well, I was going to say, I kind of think they did. Just, I think they they went off of the whole Boston thing, and like you said, because I mean, they, when I mean, you look at Horford's game, it's too much like you know a five. You know, I think they wanted him to be a shooter well, they more than rebounding. They got killed on the boards right. the previous year. So, um, yeah. I, I, but I, I, I still think too, and I keep coming back to this that other coaches have done it with guys like that. You know, yeah. uh, you can do that. You know, the Spurs has, ha, did that for years with with some you know some big guys, and I don't think the coaching here or the the and the offensive scheme and everything lend itself to that. I, I'm not giving up on completely on the fact that Horford could be inserted into the starting lineup as a four. Right. Maybe. That's where I think about a shooting, too. <laughs> so for me, Elton Brand, I, I just don't know, like, and I don't recall what his role, like, like after he retired as a player, like, what, what, how has he progressed? I didn't look it up. I should have. How he progressed as an executive or whatever. And to me, it seemed like he got into the role of GM maybe a little bit too quickly or too early in his career and he might be just a tad not He's, not yeah. like wait not experience enough right like yes. just a tad over his head a little bit. maybe i mean he worked for the g league for the sixers right and i mean he there wasn't much time from when he left the sixers as a player and when i think they, they brought him back as a player right even then right. to be a, a veteran piece and within less than know. five years i don't know Less than five years, that right. was, from the time he came back as a player where, eh, hey, I really don't want you to play, just help lead, right. to he's, G, you know, GM. Yeah, so I don't know. Well, I don't, but maybe, I'm not saying he needs to go or whatever. I sort of, I don't know. I, I, but my thought was like, well, I thought about like, well, if he goes, who are we bringing in or whatever? I can't think of a name that I'm bringing in that I'm like, okay, this guy's definitely a GM. Right. He's going to do better or whatever. So, you know, I would not maybe make the change, give him a little bit more time or whatever, see if he can – solve the puzzle this time this year or whatever but maybe next year you know like you did sort of with Brett Brown you gave him you know gave him some time with the keys or whatever same thing with Elton Brand give him some time here or whatever see if he can solve it and, and like that's what I mean I don't know who's if it was his complete choice when you know with the people they brought in this past year right if that was all Elton Brand then you're like mm, you know like you know yeah, that's that's the whole problem is I think we were so great last year and you know what we lost, and then we did not gain. Right, but m- most of those deals, when they occurred, well, I st- we all kind of felt were pretty good deals at the time, and just didn't pan out for the most part. I mean, I think we recognized that they were going to miss the JJ Redick role from Jump Street. You know, we that that role well, of a shooter. I think yeah. I don't know that anyone felt that any of those guys on the lineup were going to fill that role. Well, I think they were going to. They were trying a different. It backfired. They tried to do a different game. They, they you know, they wanted to do a bully ball, the big defensive, they, right? Whatever. They wanted to be the defensive, whatever, and all that. And you know, it worked at home. Yeah. You know that's, but you know the lack of shooting. You know, especially in a league where that's where it is. I mean, you're looking at teams. You know, like you know Houston and that. You know, that's all they that's all they do is shoot. Like right, you look at shooting charts. There's nothing in the mid range. Right. Well, and you know, I, I you mentioned it earlier, Matt. So I'm going to steal it from you when we talked earlier, which is you know he let a guy like T.J. McConnell walk. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, and I, I was a, I, I like T.J. McConnell a lot, a guy that earned his his stripes and everything. And you let him walk. You could have kept him for not very much money. Right. And and who'd you get in return? Well, Howell Neto. Uh, Shake Milton. Uh, well, you Mil- know, Milton was well, he was actually. A, he, I think he was like a two way guy. In, in yeah, he was yeah. a G leaguer, so, and you know, a guy, another guy they let go, who's doing some good stuff is Trey Burke. Burke. Yeah. You yeah. know, so those guys, like, uh, you know, okay, I'm not going to tell you that T.J. McConnell is going to be the guy that's going to take you to the mountaintop, right. but he's a floor general who will run things well, and, and he plays very smart. Be. Well, and he's steady. Yes. You know, your backup point guard does not have to be flashy, whatever. He has to come in, be Do steady, right. right, keep the ship right during his time on the floor, and and not be a liability. 
And he's just, he was scrappy. Right. He played hard. I mean, it's one of those guys, and I, I said to my son more than once, T.J. McConnell got his job in the NBA because he was playing for a horrible Sixers team and worked his butt off to say, right. I'm a valuable piece. Right. That's what he did. He benefited from playing from a, a terrible Sixers team when they were t- – otherwise, he might not have had any playing time to prove right. what he could become. Right. Um, and, I, I, again, I'm not saying that McConnell takes you to the promised no. land, but why you let him walk to replace him with Halu Neto, who I'm sorry, Neto could have left the bubble and I wouldn't have been sad. So where do you want to go from here? So I think we need to talk about coaches. coaches? Though. Like yeah. what? Yeah. Who who do we want to see as their coach? And I, you know, I, I know the big name out there is 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 Lou, and you know, I'm not convinced about Lou being being the guy. You know what I hear and read and see about him is that he's tough and 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 that and they need a tough. They need a guy that's tough. Yeah. So the characteristics they need a guy that's going to be tough on them. You know, Lou ran on the coattails of LeBron, and I really think LeBron was coaching that team that won the title, not him. But maybe there's more to him than that. I mean, there's a lot of guys out there, you know, that are some names uh, that are interesting. You know, of course, the one that I think people are going to talk about is Jay Wright, and I'm going to tell you right now, everybody, I don't think Jay Wright's leaving Villanova. He's out of his mind if he does. Yes, he will be out of his mind. To come situation, he's out of his mind. Why leave happy? Because he's happy where he is and doing a great job. And and making money, too. And the college game doesn't always translate to the pro game. I think, you know, because of the other jobs opened, that's the other thing. You know, you if you look at the Sixers, and we just mentioned all those high praised guys, you know, the, the coach that's going to come in here is going to know what he's, you know, pretty much knows what he's yeah, getting. He's done. Um, yeah, and like, you know, think of even some East teams. Indiana now has, needs a coach yeah. who's at this point better. Brooklyn, who's going to have right. two great players? Right. They're, I mean, you know, I was just Proven listening again. Stars. Well, I was just right. looking, like you know, they said right now. If you look at the East going into next year, like the, the uh, Sixers are going to be like maybe seventh. Yeah, you know, like going into this year, we were supposed to be top four. You know, top yeah. one of the top teams. Um, so you know, at Gren, though, I don't know. You know, it's still a big time team, um, right. and there's no, there's only thirty jobs. That are there, so you're, I think we're still going to get somebody. I'm thinking of somebody like, and I I don't know, again coaching with Jason Kidd, but I think of a Jason Kidd because he's similar to Ben in that you know he didn't shoot real well yeah, and he was poor right. general. Maybe he can get to him. I don't know. He seemed and he seemed like he was tough. That he hopefully can get more out of Joel Embiid. Well, he helped uh, Kidd before Budenholzer, whatever the Bucks coach is now. Kid was with the right. Bucks, so I mean, he helped Giannis improve similarly. Right. So maybe he would be a name, but I just don't know enough about me, me. Jason Kidd as a head right. coach. I don't know how many years he was in Milwaukee. But I, I don't know it. either, but I'm glad you brought him up because he was definitely somebody on my list of guys. And what he brings is a resume, which I think a guy like a Joel Embiid needs to see that in order to maybe respect. get his attention to respect right. him because right. I think it's going to be hard to get Joel to really listen to somebody and so I think you need somebody with a resume as a player right. and as a coach that they're going to come in and Joel's going to pay attention because I don't think he paid attention to Brett Brown for whatever the reasons right. were he didn't pay attention well, to him maybe nobody can get him to pay attention well I was right. going to say I think the other problem going back to Brett Brown real quick too is like because of you know you think of Joel and Bede and Ben they came from when they weren't good you know, and you had that whole, you know, process, right. you know, so that's, you know, when you have another coach coming in here, hopefully it's just going to be completely different. Yeah, I that's know why, you got some, well, yeah, That's why I don't think you can go to one of the assistants or anything there. I think you need fresh one people. Of, one of, oh, one of the assistants? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. So, Matt, what yeah, do you got? I have some, a few guys written down. Uh, one thing I thought about with Ty Lue is, how can a guy come and coach a franchise he when he got over. stepped over? <laughs> <laughs> you got none of those guys are around, yeah. but all the Philadelphia yeah. fans remember, remember it, that, and then but, some. Right? Uh, yes, my son brought that up immediately when we talked about yeah. it. Uh, other guys I have wrote, written down are, uh, and this, they, these names always come up when it comes to coaching searches or whatever. Uh, Jeff Van Gundy, I always loved him as coach of the Knicks. I thought he was a great coach, and I looked it up. I didn't realize he didn't. His record wasn't as great as I thought it was, but I always think of him. I mean, his his. Analysis on right. on on ESPN and ABC are all to me are always spot on, and his his another his his cohort there, Mark Jackson, his name always comes. At least up. He, and he was an pl- ex player, so. ex player, and um, you know he coached the Warriors, and you know before Kirk came <laughs> on board, he coached them up. 
You know, I mean, there, there were rumors out there that, you know, he shouldn't have been replaced and was replaced, you know, on the down low or whatever. But anyhow, so he comes up. Um, and then a couple guys I had were that are, aren't available, but I had down as sort of missed opportunities. And for two different reasons. One was Tom Thibodeau, who is now going to be the coach of the Knicks. Right. Tom Thibodeau, I remember specifically as a Lakers fan, when he was the assistant to Doc Rivers in Boston, he was the reason they won the title in 08 or whatever against the Lakers, I believe it was. Um, his defensive strategies or whatever, uh, I don't know whether he'd be able to – He's definitely authoritative, like an right. authoritative. That's why, yeah, the person. Jimmy so, Butler thing. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. So he Maybe might too not, much. Right, like, exactly. I'm a little that's, worried about because he's on my list of like guys that, yeah, this would right. be the kind of guy. Maybe right, but he's not available anyhow. Right. And the other person I had written down, who the Sixers actually had in house, who is now, and my son told me before I came here, was the coach of the bubble. It was Monty Williams, yes. the current coach of the Suns. Right. He was an assistant with the Sixers, and the Sixers let him walk to the Suns when maybe that would have been the time to be like and plus Monty Williams was a coach I believe in New Orleans and had success with Chris Paul back in the day or well, not back in the day but several years ago or whatever and so he has head coaching experience he's doing well with the Suns and their young team and I just think from a mentor standpoint like you mentioned Matt I think he's the perfect I think he'd be the perfect mentor coach for uh, Ben Simmons but again he's not available right. so well, another name I was going to yeah. say, I'm, I'm just hearing, now it, this has got to be far-fetched, but because they're also talking for this guy for Brooklyn, is Popovich. Maybe, again, this is far-fetched, but then when they, they, he, he was a name that's now brought up. Uh, I don't see him coming to Phil. No, I don't. See and him I don't. I mean, I don't really he, know if he's. He's he, talking with Brett Brown. Brett Brown I don't. Yeah, that's what I mean. But I don't really see him going to Brooklyn either. But maybe, yeah, maybe once know. it changed, I don't know. But I don't see. No, that's, I don't see. that's part of that. It goes to a lot, number of guys you mentioned, which is I. What's the motivation for them to want to come? So Popovich, right. I don't know why he would right. want to come. Right. I'm like Van Gundy, like Van Gundy, like both Van Gundys. Yes, to be Stan too. Yeah. But I don't know why Jeff. Like I don't know why guys would leave. A good job good doing thing. commentating where there's zero pressure right. to to go back into coaching. Especially that pressure. You know, right. like the pressure, pressure in Philadelphia with this team. Like, I, I wouldn't mind a Van Gundy. Right. But why would – so, yeah, I don't know why any Van Gundy or anyone else would leave those kinds of situations uh, to go back into coaching in that kind of pressure. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So, I think we've kind of covered it up, guys. There's a lot more we could say about the Philadelphia 76ers and things they could do, should do, might do. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, we know that there's a lot of work this team has to do for next Absolutely. year. And, you know, we'll see. We'll see what they put together, and we'll hope for a better season, as we always do as Philadelphia fans. The mantra of the Philadelphia fan, there's always next season. That seems to be the mantra. So you've been watching and listening to the Two Mats and a Jeff podcast. Uh, like us on Facebook and Instagram, and follow us, uh, you know, on YouTube. And listen on Spotify or Anchor or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next time.